Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals, online at niswatax.com. Hello again, I'm Jason Edens, your host of Lakeland Currents. Thanks for joining the conversation today, and thanks for your ongoing support of Lakeland Public TV. Friends, here in our viewing area, we are fortunate to have several incredible academic institutions. Of course, right here in Lakeland Public TV's backyard is Bemidji State University and Northwest Technical College. And it's my pleasure to welcome President of BSU and Northwest Tech, Dr. Faith Hensrud. Dr. Hensrud, welcome to the program and thank you so much for making time today. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate the opportunity to be here again. Well, first and foremost, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that steering a major academic institution through a pandemic must be incredibly challenging. It's certainly no small feat. So I just want to acknowledge that and some of the challenges that you and your colleagues and your staff are experiencing. Yeah, it definitely is. It certainly isn't anything that any of us would have anticipated. I, I do know back in, I think it was 2009, we did pandemic planning at my previous institution and it was, we never planned far enough. I can tell you that. Interesting. Well, you've been with BSU now for four years as Correct. president. And yes. during that time period, I'm curious, what has changed under your leadership? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we've really done is we've re-emphasized our commitment to serving our uh, American Indian communities uh, in the region and in the state and actually beyond the state as well. And we've been very successful at um, getting some grants that have allowed us to do that. Um, one is a Native American nursing grant that uh, we received from the federal government that has provided funding for students over the past, uh, we're in our fourth year of a four-year grant. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, now you say you've done so even beyond the borders of Minnesota. Can you tell us more about that? How so? Yeah, so we recruit um, actually uh, nationally for the program. So we do serve our, our immediate region, but we do have um, individuals that are uh, faculty within the program that go out into the Dakotas um, to recruit and uh, ha have really um, made this program something that is on the map throughout the United States and uh, ha have had um, some opportunities for our faculty and staff to present in Florida at different conferences and have had some notoriety in um, some of the um, uh, you know, publications uh, regarding the research that we're doing with the students and the successes that we're having. So very exciting to be able to um, meet the needs both of our region, but throughout the country as well for, for Native nurses. Well, fantastic. Well, during your time at the University of Wisconsin and Superior, it's my understanding that one of your roles was to serve as the Director of Online Education and Distance Learning. And I'm curious, how has that helped you prepare for what's obviously an unprecedented fall semester of 2020. Yeah, well, you know, when I first got here, that was one of the things that I wanted to find out is, okay, what is, what is Bemidji State doing in the world of online learning? And I was very pleased when I had some conversations with our, our center um, for extended learning to hear about what it is that we were doing and to um, feel that we had our, our foot in the door and actually we're building and expanding programs so that we could be even more successful in this area. So um, it, it really, uh, for the fall semester, uh, we're at about 30% of our enrollments are online and typically we'd been about 25%. So um, that is a good thing that, you know, we already knew how to do this and we had a whole uh, faculty and staff who could support our, our faculty as they developed um, additional online learning opportunities for this um, COVID environment, if you'd like to call it that. Mm -hmm. And speaking of COVID, according to the Minnesota State COVID dashboard, it's my understanding that Bemidji State has had approximately 20 cases between staff and students since the beginning of the term. I'm just curious, how is it that you're keeping your students, your staff, and of course the broader community safe? 
Yeah, and I would say our numbers are higher than that. If you look at the um, the 60 mile radius, the, the system dashboard keeps changing on us. So first it was those with campus contact and now it's within 60 mile radius of the campus. Um, but one of the things that we did is uh, early on, we made the decision that we were gonna be a bit more conservative. And so instead of saying, uh, welcoming everybody back into our residence halls um, who wanted to live here, we were really intentional about it. And we wanted to focus on those students who were here and, and needed to be here for a very specific reason. So if their courses were face-to-face -face, or if they were working in public health or if they were working in public safety or even in the grocery industry, um, obviously our international students or those students who, who were housing insecure and um, our student athletes. Uh, so we really prioritized who would be able to start out with us this fall semester in the residence halls. And I think that has been a big, big factor. The other piece is um, just making sure that when we, I, I think, you know, the, the governor put in the mask mandate um, for the entire state, but we were actually probably a couple weeks ahead of that with our own mask mandate because mm -hmm. we just felt that that was one of the best ways that we could um, in addition to the physical distancing of six feet, that we could maintain that safety that we needed. So when you enacted a mask mandate prior to the governor's order, was it well received? Were people generally happy to adopt that practice? Yeah, I would say um, overwhelmingly, yes. Um, we have, um, we currently still have uh, weekly campus forums and when we were debating whether or not we were gonna implement this, that was one of the, the big areas of feedback that we were getting, it, you know, let's, let's have everyone wear masks. And, you know, not everybody would say yes to that, but, mm -hmm. you know, there, would, there was certainly a feeling of comfort when we did move in that direction. And it just felt, you know, it, the whole reason we wear the masks is not to protect ourselves necessarily, it's to protect those around us from us spreading the virus if, if we're asymptomatic even. Mm -hmm. I know that some of the Minnesota State institutions have experienced a dip in enrollment, potentially on account of COVID. I'm wondering, has BSU or Northwest Tech experienced something similar to this? Yeah, unfortunately, yes, we have. And um, for us at, at uh, BSU, we're down about mm, just a little over 7% for our fall enrollment compared to last year at the same time. And at NTC, that's more significant from a percentage standpoint. It's a smaller institution, so you know, small numbers can yield big percentages. So we're down about 15% there. And you know, as we were planning and budgeting for the fall semester, we really took that into consideration. We expected to be down. And we had budgeted to be down actually further than that at both institutions. So we're, we're pleased that we, um, but, you know, we're not pleased that we're down, but we're pleased that we, we didn't um, uh, experience such a significant decline as what we had projected initially. Will there be any long-term consequences of that or unintended consequences? Yeah, obviously, if you start out with a, a smaller freshman class, then that um, class rolls through and, and you're going to have smaller numbers in your sophomore class the next year and so on and, and so forth. Um, but what we're doing right now is we're really being intentional about um, how we're focusing on building the next class. And we're also looking at retention and uh, looking at, at strategies and, and, and um, determining how we can retain the students that we do have. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it's a lot less expensive to keep your students than it is to, to have to recruit them. And so um, many of the things that, that we've been doing this summer and fall are designed to help with that. Um, and I can speak to some of that if you'd like. Yes, please. So we applied for a, a couple of different grants and we were successful at getting them. Um, one of the things that you think about when you have students who now are not necessarily face-to-face -face as much as they used to be is what are their technology needs? And so, um, being able to provide additional technology support in the form of laptops or hotspots or the like is a critical piece. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we applied for a, a, a grant that was part of the governor's grant program, part of the federal funding for um, the coronavirus. Uh, and we were successful at getting that. And that uh, one grant provides 
funding for, I think it's $125,000 a year for uh, three years to help us purchase um, computers for our students. Um, so that was one. Another one that you think about is um, the mental health of your students. Mm -hmm. And um, that is always a big concern for college age students is, is how do we ensure that we're supporting our, our students in their, um, in their mental health needs as well. And so we uh, applied for another grant that actually is a collaborative grant between BSU and NTC that will allow, to, allow us to add another uh, counseling staff member. Um, to help support students, um, you know, in this particularly trying time um, that uh, that we're faced with right now. So those are two just uh, two examples of of programs that we put together. Uh, a third one is actually another grant that we received that's called a success grant, and it's geared towards um, more of a mentoring program so that we can help support our students. Um, over the next several years as um, they're um, having some, some um, challenges with, from an academic standpoint. So we have a, a program now called the Beaver Success Program that pairs um, individuals on our faculty and staff with students and um, provides them with additional support and encouragement um, so that they're able to um, continue successfully um, and make, make progress towards their degree. Well, that's fantastic. I'm really pleased to hear about the mental health work that you're doing. There certainly is no shortage of things to be anxious about these days. So I'm right. sure that'll create a supportive environment for your students. Yeah. Now, for those students that are enrolled, I'm curious, how exactly are you delivering the curriculum this semester, this year for that matter? Is it primarily distance learning? Is it a hybrid? Can you explain a little bit about that? And also, for those programs of yours that are more hands-on, how are you making that work? Nursing and some of the trades programs. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, so we have a, a a mixture of things, as you can imagine. And I'll talk BSU, and then I'll talk NTC as well. So at at BSU for the fall semester, I would say we have about a um, little less than twenty percent of our classes have face to face components, significant face to face components. And you can imagine our um, science labs. I mean, you. It's a little bit more challenging to try to, to replicate that experience in an online environment. So a lot of our labs are in a face-to-face -face, um, format. Um, we also have uh, our music programs. Um, and you might think, well, gosh, we've been hearing so much about singing and, and that not being a, a good thing when it comes to the virus and, and can cause the spread. Um, our uh, Bemidji Choir has been working very hard uh, with their faculty member and they are actually singing with masks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, the, the amazing thing is that sound is, is just wonderful because we're all craving uh, music at this Absolutely. point. But um, Dwight Jillick does an exceptional job um, with, with these students. And, um, and, and so that's just another example of how, yep, it's a challenging time, but yet we've found ways that we can do this a bit differently. And at NTC, um, I would say our percentage of face-to-face -face classes is, is higher. It's probably about 35%. And again, these are our lab types of classes. So our dental assisting program is in that format. Um, some of our, our nursing programs require face-to-face -face components. Um, our, our plumbing and H, HVAC, our electrical, automotive, all of those programs require hands-on components. And we have a new uh, program, it's a commercial refrigeration program. And we actually just renovated uh, lab space for that program and it is just an amazing space. Um, I'd like to invite Lakeland to come and take a look at it at some point. Well, I appreciate the invitation very much. You know, one of the things I've been curious about with regard to distance learning is quality assurance. I'm curious, how are you in real time conducting some sort of quality assurance to ensure that, of course, students' learning outcomes are approximately the same as they would be in a traditional classroom? Yeah. Are you concerned that in the future we might look back and learn that those students who went through distance learning had lesser educational outcomes? Yeah, one of the things we do is in preparation up front, um, we have a partnership with uh, an organization called Quality Matters, mm -hmm. and this is really focused on quality in online education. 
And um, there are certain criteria that you use when you're putting together an, uh, an online course so that you can make sure that you're creating the best experience possible in that type of an environment. And the courses are actually reviewed by um, other peers um, when, you're, when you're putting it together so that there are aspects that um, we make sure that we're including. And, um, you know, I think from a quality, you know, real-time perspective, I think it's the feedback that our students are, are providing, um, either providing directly to their faculty member of what they may need more of or, or less of. Um, I think the biggest challenge right now is because we have students who aren't used to the, the online environment, they're used to the face-to-face -face environment, I think they're finding it, it's more challenging um, because you have to have self-discipline um, and you have to have that ability to really pace yourself throughout the semester in order to get the work done. Um, otherwise, it'll start to pile up on you. And so uh, really, uh, our faculty are working very hard to engage the students and to keep them um, current and working, um, you know, in real time with the course material and with the faculty member. And in addition to that, um, I've talked to a few faculty members who have said, you know, there are some things that we're doing now. Um, for example, uh, some faculty are recording Zoom lectures. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're either doing it in, a student can view it later, or they're doing it so it's synchronous, so everybody has to be there at the same time. And, uh, and then they're recording it so that if somebody misses it, they can go back to it. And I heard one faculty member shared with me that he said, you know what, There's, I think I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna keep doing the recording aspect of it so that someone who isn't able to be in class for, for a reason can catch up with it. So I think we're learning a lot uh, as we go through this and we're not perfect, I can tell you that. Um, I mean, there, there's always, there are always ways that you can improve. Well, your confidence that the learning outcomes won't be compromised is... No, yeah, it, I mean, our accrediting agency expects that of us. So mm -hmm. we most definitely um, have the same learning outcomes. And, and you probably know that was, that was part of my um, doctoral dissertation is quality in online distance education. So it's, it's a, an area of keen interest to me that um, we do have this under control. I discovered that in my work preparing for our conversation today. So speaking uh, of distance learning, obviously there's still very much of a digital divide in the United States, and that's particularly pronounced in rural communities like Northern Minnesota. So I'm curious, you know, for those students who don't have access to uh, premier connectivity or perhaps can't afford it, how yep. are you ensuring that their educational outcomes won't be compromised? Now you did speak to this a little bit with regard to one yeah. of the grants, but can you just tell us a little bit more about how you're ensuring that's not gonna bear upon student success? Yeah, so one of the things that we did early on is um, we actually surveyed our students to find out what, what their situation was regarding technology. And that was helpful and useful for us in, in our application for the GEAR grant that I, I mentioned. And I'll give you the, I have a note of what it stands for. It's the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Grant, um, G-E-E-R. And uh, that was designed to help meet that need. So pro providing laptops and providing hotspots. Now we recognize that that may not even be enough for some of our students. So the other thing that we've done is we have, um, I, we put a hotspot out in, in our, I believe it's our AIRC, American Indian Resource Center parking lot. So if, a, if an individual needed to go there, we have labs on campus open so that they can come on campus. Uh, in computer labs as well as in the library to access the technology that they need. So um, those are a few things that that we're doing to help, um, you know, ensure that our students are are able to um, complete their coursework. Well, that's really impressive that you're able to pivot so quickly. So I commend you and your colleagues for doing so. I have to that say that our good. faculty have been instrumental in this and have been really exceptional. So very pleased about that. I'm sure. Well, there is an achievement gap uh, here in Minnesota that is quite pronounced. And I'm curious if you see that at BSU, and if so, has COVID exacerbated that achievement gap? Yeah, that, that is a very real thing at both Bemidji State and Northwest Technical College. And it's something that we have been um, focused on for quite some time. And yes, most definitely COVID has an impact on it. 
And it, and it may be an impact that you find some individuals, some students who are just saying, you know what, I can't, I can't do this in an online format or in this particular environment. And I need to step out for a period of time. Um, or it may be that they are struggling a lot more. So, um, so it's, it's a very real thing. And it's something that, uh, again, some of the, the, the success grant that we received, that's one of the ways that we're hoping to address um, some of those challenges with our students who, who are, are having some challenges with this, um, both the COVID situation and learning in a different format than, than they were previously. So right now across the country, there's a lot of divisiveness and we're having some very important, but periodically acrimonious conversations about equity and justice. So my question for you is, how do you steer BSU through these times and build both a sense of community and a shared vision? Yeah, this is something that, that um, we address and have addressed um, in some of our campus forums. Um, and we have also had some community conversations that are going to be starting up here pretty quickly um, at the end of October. Uh, our um, Community Engagement Council is focused on uh, actually uh, between October, end of October and May, um, to have a series of conversations, um, not only for our faculty and staff and students here, but for our community. Mm -hmm. And we can certainly provide you some more information uh, about that. But one of the, the first ones will be uh, focused on social justice. And so some of our faculty members, particularly in, in sociology, will be leading um, a panel discussion related to that that will be open to our, our community as a whole um, here in, in Bemidji and Beltrami County. So that's just one of the things. The other thing is we have some really engaged faculty members that have been um, focused on um, systemic racism for quite some time. And they are, and, and I'll call out our psychology faculty. Um, they put together some resources over the summer that really help um, students. It was geared towards students initially, but we're, go we're going to be sharing that out with our faculty and staff that provides opportunities for each of us to grow our own capacity um, in, in our understanding, our, our understanding of ourself and our own um, beliefs and values and how we can um, really take up the mantle to fight systemic racism and to really take some of that burden off of our black and brown brothers and sisters so that um, they're not doing this on their own. Um, you know, I, I made the statement to the campus community that, you know, it, it's, it's time for us. It's beyond time for us to do this, uh, this work alongside them. So, Indeed. Well, Dr. Hensrud, we only have a couple minutes left here. So I've just got a couple more questions. Uh, as you know, uh, I'm very proud to call BSU my alma mater or one of my alma maters. And I think, you know, that sustainability and clean energy are very important to me personally. I wanted to source a uh, question from a student and share that question with you. And it is, when and how will BSU begin to shift away from fossil fuels and adopt a climate appropriate solution to its energy needs in the future? Yeah, so um, gosh, way back under uh, President Quiskard, uh, Bemidji State signed on to the, what was called the President's Climate Commitment. Um, and that was probably back in maybe 2013, if I'm, if I'm remembering that correctly. And when I came here, that was one of the, the top items on our students' minds was the climate commitment. And um, so there was an opportunity for me to reaffirm that. But in addition to that, um, I signed a, another component of that, which is a, a resiliency component. And so um, there's, there's the, the carbon commitment as part of the climate commitment, and then there's the resiliency component, which is the community focus. So we're working towards that. And we do have a, a goal to be um, uh, become um, less dependent upon fossil fuels and, and um, more uh, neutral, I think by the year 2050 is what I'm, I'm recalling. And I have to say that our facilities staff and folks on our campus are doing an exceptional job of reducing a lot of our energy expenditures um, with LED light is, is one thing that, that we've done very successfully. 
And we've tried uh, a couple of different ways to uh, look at some solar projects here um, at BSU, and we've not yet found uh, anything that has panned out for us. So we're still looking for opportunities there uh, to uh, continue to reduce um, that, that carbon footprint. Well, it's exciting to see a lot of your peers in the Minnesota State Institution System begin to deploy ambitious solar projects. And so I look forward to hearing about what BSU is going to do in the future. But I've just got two more questions for you here. If you can spare a couple more minutes. Sure. The first of which is, of course, BSU just celebrated its centennial last year. And I'm wondering, what are you looking forward to in the coming years, uh, despite COVID, even though we're you know, heavily focused on the challenges that, are, that we're facing with COVID. What are you looking forward to for BSU and NTC's future? Yeah, so I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the new building that we have um, that's just getting finished here in October. Uh, replacement for Hagsauer Hall is, is just about completed and we will be having a ribbon cutting uh, for that in um, early to mid-November. And so that's an exciting opportunity to really have another space on campus that engages our students in active learning and active learning classrooms. Um, but in addition to that, you know, when we set out our strategic plan back in 2018, uh, 2018 to 2023, we really had a couple of key things in there that I feel that we have great potential to, to achieve. And one of them is to become a destination uh, university for American Indian students. And the other one is uh, to create a safe and welcome, welcoming environment for all students. So I think, you know, here in, in Bemidji and Beltrami County, we have um, a lot of potential to um, diversify our campus population, our student population, as well as our faculty and staff, and to help um, do a better job of meeting regional needs for our American Indians um, in the state of Minnesota, but also um, beyond our borders of the state as well. So those are two um, key areas of focus and um, to ensure that we're preparing our students as they go out and, and live and work in a very diverse world and to have the, the skills and the resources that they need to be able to be successful. Um, the other thing, uh, I expect that we'll be starting a, a campaign um, through our foundation at some point in the future. Uh, after I came in, or just as I was coming in, we had just completed a very successful uh, campaign under President Hansen. And uh, it's, it's time to really start thinking about what that next campaign looks like and to ensure that we're providing um, the resources that our students need in order to be successful uh, moving forward. So uh, very excited about that, as well as our uh, ability to engage within our community and uh, be that um, institution, both institutions for, for our region where we're meeting regional needs and we are serving um, the business businesses in our area. Dr. Hedzrud, I wanna thank you so much for the work that you do on behalf of our future and our community. And thank you so much for making time for our conversation today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jason. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank all of you for joining me once again. I'm Jason Edens, your host of Lakeland Currents. Be kind and be well. We'll see you next week. <laughs>